Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this Asia-Pacific Foundation event with uh, Secretary Enrique Manolo of the uh, Republic of Philippines. This is one of our first events in a new series that Asia-Pacific Foundation is launching, which is a, a series of speakers from Indo-Pacific region, so leaders from the Indo-Pacific region, and we're delighted that uh, Secretary Manolo will be our first uh, such distinguished speaker for this event. Uh, let me also acknowledge that today we're gathered uh, on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and the Tsleil-Waututh peoples. We are grateful to the indigenous peoples of Canada for their stewardships of the lands on which we live, work, and play. Uh, let me also note that, of course, I'm Vina Najibullah. I'm the Vice President of the Asia Pacific Foundation for Research and Strategy. And on behalf of our President and all of my colleagues who are here in the room, we want to say thank you for um, being with us, but also thank Minister for being with us here and for uh, making a stop in Vancouver, which is the gateway to the Asia Pacific. The Minister is here for the first time as a Secretary, uh, and of course he'll be going to Ottawa and to Toronto for meetings with various uh, Ministers and senior officials in Ottawa, but we thought it would be really appropriate for him to have this uh, public event, this opportunity to speak to the broader community. Uh, as you know, Filipino-Canadian community is really robust. We have over one million people who trace their origins to Philippines. It's a dynamic community, and we thought it would be really appropriate uh, as part of the mandate of Asia Pacific Foundation, which is to build closer ties between Canada and Asia to host this event and create this public platform uh, for dialogue. The minister's, the secretary's trip to Canada comes at an opportune time. We're celebrating 75 years of friendly relations between Philippines and Canada. It's also part of deepening of Canada's engagement with the Indo-Pacific because of the Indo-Pacific strategy. The strategy was launched in 2022, and of course, Philippines, because of its location, because of its significance, it's at the heart of the Indo-Pacific and is central to Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy, which is also why we've seen so much engagement between Philippines and Canada in the last two years. We've had visits of our uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister Jolie, uh, to Manila last year. We're also obviously seeing the Secretary's visit here to Canada, and we hope to welcome uh, President Marcos, if possible, later this year, all signifying the need to deepen this really important relationship, a relationship that's built on close people-to-people -people ties, but also on shared values and shared interests in having an open and free Indo-Pacific, in promoting democracy, in making sure that our peoples have economic growth, inclusive trade, and um, growth, as well as combating environmental issues, climate change issues. Philippines is one of the countries that is most impacted by adverse impacts of climate. We'll be hearing more about that, I'm sure, from the Secretary. But it is good to note that as part of its engagement, Canada is already uh, deepening and supporting Philippines' efforts in uh, dealing with climate change, as well as in preserving its maritime sovereign rights in the South China Sea, or West Philippine Sea, as it's also known. And I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that as well. The relations between Canada Canada and uh, the uh, Philippines, while the diplomatic relations are 75 years old, the relationship between people and businesses is even longer. In fact, one of our companies, Sun Life, has been in Philippines for over 100 years, and many, in fact, think that Sun Life might be even local in Philippines, which is a testament to how well they have integrated and how close the relationship has been. So. Uh, Part of that relationship is also, of course, at the provincial level, and we're really delighted that um, we have Minister Bruce Ralston here with us, who's the Minister of Forestry, but also the Minister responsible for Consular Affairs and Relations with the Consular Corps. And I'd like to uh, give him now the floor to offer some welcoming remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, Your Excellency, Secretary for Foreign Affairs of the Republic of uh, the Philippines, uh, Enrique Manalo, welcome. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, the Ambassador of the Philippines to Canada, Maria Austria, who's no stranger to uh, Vancouver, of course, and also Consul General Arlene Magno. There are other members of the Consular Corps who are probably too numerous to name individually, but you're all welcome. Um, I also want to acknowledge members of the Asia Pacific Foundation, Simon Fraser University, and other distinguished guests. It's great to see former Senator, Senator Jack Austin. This is his baby, Asia Pacific Foundation, um, and uh, he's here again uh, to, to, uh, 
to participate with us. Thank you for the introduction, Vina. And, and thank you to the foundation for organizing this important event. That's exactly, I think, the, the vision that Senator Austin had in, uh, in creating this institution. So on behalf of the government of British Columbia, let me particularly welcome Secretary Manolo to our province. Um, I have the honor to pass on greetings from uh, Premier David Eby. The House is uh, sitting today, and uh, he was not able to come personally, but he conveys his warmest regards. Um, let me also acknowledge we're on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Um, Canada and uh, British Columbia enjoy very warm relations with the Philippines, and we are delighted to be celebrating 75 years of diplomatic relations. People-to-people -people ties are foundational to this relationship. I understand uh, that the first Filipino to settle in Canada uh, Benson Flores came to Bowen Island, not too far from here, uh, British Columbia in 1861, and his life and legacy were recently commemorated by members of the Filipino community here in British Columbia. But it wasn't really until a century later that we were able to attract large num larger numbers of Filipinos to our province, and of course that uh, community has grown enormously. Um, Vina mentioned the, the number of Filipinos uh, across Canada. Uh, here in British Columbia, we uh, count about 175,000 uh, members of the diaspora community. And of course, that community is well known for having made enormous contributions to social, economic, and cultural life of the province. Uh, in the field of politics, for example, in 2009, my colleague Mabel Elmore made history by becoming the first member of the BC legislature of Filipino heritage, and she now serves as parliamentary secretary for anti-racism -raci initiatives. And our, our, our connections with the Philippines stretch beyond the important people-to-people -people realm. Um, I very much look forward to uh, Secretary Manolo's keynote address about the Philippines' strategic interest in the Indo-Pacific, its partnership with Canada, and the challenges and opportunities ahead. Uh, let me spend a few minutes uh, describing our own province's relations with the Philippines and the Indo-Pacific. BC welcomed Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy when it was announced here in Vancouver in November 2022. That strategy closely aligns with our provincial interests in creating opportunities to expand trade and investment, grow good jobs, and build supply chain resilience. Because of our geography, obviously, transportation networks, strong people-to-people -people ties across the Pacific, and the products and services we're able to offer the world, British Columbia is the province in Canada with the greatest connection to the Indo-Pacific. About 37% of our goods exports go to the Indo-Pacific. Of those, about $1 billion in goods are exported to Southeast Asia, including about $200 million to the Philippines. Collectively, the ASEAN countries represent BC's sixth largest market. Last year, British Columbia uh, released its trade diversification strategy and highlighted key new markets in Southeast Asia, including the Philippines, as markets where British Columbia will help its companies access new customers and build new relationships. In recognition of the strategic importance of the countries that make up ASEAN and the wider Indo-Pacific region, Premier Ibi chose to lead his first international trade mission last year to Japan, South Korea, and Singapore. In Singapore, the Premier had the opportunity to speak to the Canada ASEAN Business Council and explore ways to increase trade and other connections with ASEAN partners. British Columbia has the most extensive a trade and investment network of any Canadian province in ASEAN with trade and investment representatives co-located with Canadian diplomatic missions in Singapore, Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Indeed, of BC's 20 international trade offices, 15 are located in the Indo-Pacific region. We continue to seek opportunities to strengthen uh, economic ties with the Philippines, Canada's international trade minister has just announced the Team Canada trade mission to the Philippines in December 2024, not so far away, and BC companies will certainly be among those participating. 
We have other connections as well. Uh, last year, the then Minister for Post-Secondary Education and Future Skills visited the Philippines to support higher education partnerships. She also explored opportunities for cooperation in bilateral healthcare education and improved recognition of Philippines nursing and healthcare worker education and credentials, a key issue here in British Columbia. I know the very effective and active uh, representatives of both the Philippines Embassy in Ottawa and the Consulate General in Vancouver are pursuing many other avenues uh, for uh, cooperation. Uh, uh, Consul General Magno had a long checklist for me for this year, uh, so we're working our way through it. And I, I, I applaud their efforts. Finally, we support uh, Canada's efforts to strengthen its relationship with ASEAN, including work on a Canada ASEAN free trade agreement, as well as increased security cooperation with ASEAN and its members. That includes Canada working together with the Philippines and other ASEAN partners to ensure full respect for international law in the South China Sea. Secretary Manolo, once again, on behalf of the province of British Columbia, I'd like to welcome you and your delegation and offer our warm friendship and desire to grow even stronger ties between our jurisdictions and our peoples. Thank you very much and welcome again. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank Without further ado, let me get to the main event of reason why you're all here, our guest of honor. Please join me in warmly welcoming Secretary Manalo to the stage for his keynote address. Thank you very much. At the outset, I wish to respectfully acknowledge the Squamish, the tsleil and Muskiam peoples on whose sacred, unceded ancestral territories we are gathered today. Ladies and gentlemen, a uh, very pleasant good morning to all our distinguished guests here. Uh, first, let me say how pleased I am to be here in Vancouver and to wish to thank the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada for hosting uh, this morning's event. Vancouver holds a special place in the history of uh, Philippines-Canada relations. Um, I think it was mentioned briefly uh, just uh, earlier. It was in Vancouver, particularly in Bowen Island, that the first Filipino immigrant in Canada, Benson Flores, arrived in 1861 and lived there around the time that Canada became a constitutional monarchy. He was a fisherman whose ship traversed the Pacific and called on the bustling port of Vancouver in 1996, a Sun Life Canada branch opened in Manila, and five years later, another Canadian insurance company, Manulife, opened an office in Manila. Today, the nearly one million Canadians with Filipino heritage bear witness to these abiding human and socioeconomic ties, portending closer connections ahead for our two countries. Our bonds were forged in the fires of the Second World War, after which we both stood arm in arm to build a new architecture of the global order centered on the United Nations as partners amongst its 51 founding members. Even then, our leaders acknowledged our shared values. Uh, in 1946, Canadian Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie King wrote Manuel Rojas, then President of the Philippines, the first World War II president of the post World War II president of the Philippines, expressing, quote, the hope and belief of the Canadian people that the partnership of the peoples of Canada and the Philippines in the Pacific War and their continued collaboration in the building of a new world order will result in bringing our two countries together in ever closer cooperation and friendship. In the negotiations on the UN Charter in San Francisco in 1945, Filipino diplomat Carlos P. Romulo was the voice of the voiceless millions, insisting that the right to independence of all colonial peoples had to be respected if peace was to endure. Lester Pearson also staunchly supported the right to sovereignty and the cause of international peace when crisis hit the Suez Canal in 1956. 
Both Romola and Pearson, the fourth and seventh presidents of the United Nations General Assembly, respectively, embodied our two people's vision for an open, inclusive, and rules-based international order and for global peace. Pearson was later known as the father of United Nations peacekeeping, a tradition to which the Philippines has also contributed actively. Romulo rallied the leaders of the developing world into affirming the rule of law through the 1982 Manila Declaration on the Peaceful Settlement of Disputes. Both Romulo's and Pearson's legacies form part of the indelible bonds and shared values that we recall as we now commemorate the 75th anniversary of our formal diplomatic relations this year. In his address to the United Nations in 2022, President Ferdinand R. Marcos Jr. said that the world is now in a quote, a watershed moment, one ready for transformation and one that must address transcendent challenges and also opportunities. These challenges now are a consequence as the challenges are as consequential as the challenges of the times of Messrs. Romolo and Pearson. And Canada understands this when Foreign Minister Jolie describing the state of play in the world as one akin to, quote, tectonic plates of the world order shifting beneath our feet, unquote. So against such a backdrop, the Philippines and Canada understand that this global order we helped build over seven decades must evolve along transformative shifts and deliver durable and far-seeing global solutions to the problems of our time. To the Philippines, the transformative moment must lead to a new global solidarity addressing the climate emergency, the degradation of ecosystems, persistent inequities, the malign use of emerging technologies and their threat to human life and dignity and international humanitarian law. We must address the risks of global pandemics and the weaponization of space, cyber and maritime domains, among others. In the path to collective action, countries have to navigate complexities arising from the new geopolitical dynamics, including the rise of China and sharpening polarities amidst the conflicts in the Ukraine and Gaza. Friends, in the context of the Philippines' independent foreign policy, quote, as a friend to all and enemy to none, unquote, and the Philippines' contributions to the cause of global peace and justice, in this context, President Marcos has underscored that we see the rules-based global order as an important ballast that stabilizes our common vessel amidst challenging global tides. President Marcos has underscored we see the rules-based global order as an important ballast that stabilizes our common vessels amidst changing global ties. So therefore, that is our open, inclusive, and rules-based international order that is governed by international law and informed by the principles of equity and justice. This is true in the Indo-Pacific region. Our region is very much in the driver's seat of the global post-pandemic economic resurgence and dynamism. It is also host to what are considered hotspots in international security, such as the South China Sea, the Taiwan Straits, and the Korean Peninsula. Only diplomacy, fully adhering to international law, can ensure that the Indo-Pacific delivers its promise as an engine of the 21st century global economic transformation. So it is important that we acknowledge the following realities. Firstly, the centrality of ASEAN in shaping the landscape of the Indo-Pacific region. ASEAN must be the lead actor in the regional security architecture, no matter how many minilaterals may emerge. ASEAN has been, and in the foreseeable future, the ground where all the other powers of the world interact and engage regularly. The Philippines is slated to chair ASEAN in 2026. Secondly, the future of this region is being shaped not by one or two powers, but by many actors, each with their own agency and legitimate interests. Indo-Pacific discussions must embrace the voices of these actors, 
including the ASEAN countries and Pacific Island states individually and collectively. This is the case in our immediate neighborhood, where China is advancing an illegitimate claim on the entire South China Sea region with aggressive unilateral actions that undermine international law and threaten peace and stability. However, the Philippines finds that over-characterizing developments, uh, however, the Philippines finds that over-characterizing the developments in the South China Sea mainly as a function of the U.S.-China strategic rivalry, muddle understanding of the situation on the ground. For one, it places the legitimate rights and interests of countries like the Philippines aside and secondary to the interests of its ri of rivals. It also obscures our judgment, actions that are clearly illegal in international law and against the UN Charter are sometimes justified under the pretext of this rivalry. At the same time, remedies to respond to these actions are viewed by a party or by any party in the prism of the strategic rivalry. Thirdly, the rule of law underpins the global order that fosters respect, trust, and predictability in interstate relations, which also call out any form of coercion, intimidation, or the use of force and threat of the use of force. And this is a reason for our commitment to build partnerships with like-minded countries who share our advocacy for the rule of law, especially the international law of the sea, particularly UNCLOS. Our rules-based global order also underwrites multilateralism that facilitates convergence and galvanizes global action. For as long as there is no credible alternative to United Nations and multilateral institutions, we must persevere in making these institutions work. Fourthly, our overarching objective remains to be the peaceful pursuit of development and more prosperous economies for our peoples. Geopolitical anxieties should not detract us from this. Friends and colleagues, I cited at the beginning that the Philippines together with Canada were among the original members of the United Nations. In fact, there were only three founding members from Asia, Philippines, India, and China. And I mentioned this to highlight two points. First, that in standing by the rules-based order as partners for peace and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific, including the South China Sea, the Philippines and Canada are reinforcing a mission that has been set for our relationship from the beginning. Secondly, the Philippines has and will remain committed to the United Nations, and we have contributed accordingly to rulemaking in human rights, international humanitarian law, humanitarian disarmament, and international of the, of the sea, among others. Our adherence to the rules-based approach is the key to the management and resolution of the overlapping claims and maritime disputes in the South China Sea stands on this rich ground. For the South China Sea is a small but vital part of the greater Indo-Pacific region. It accounts for 12% of the world's fish catch and some of the most precious ecosystems in the Coral Triangle. 40, about 40% 40 of the world's liquefied natural gas shipments also traverse the South China Sea. It is in our common interest to keep it free and open and adherent of the rules-based international order. Now this is an issue of high and great importance to the Philippines. We are an archipelagic state with the fifth largest coastline in the world. 60% of our 110 million population living by, lives by the coast and our seas comprise five-sixths of our national territory. To us, protecting our rights in our exclusive economic zone and ensuring unimpeded access is critical for safeguarding the livelihoods of our fisher folk and preserving marine resources vital to our future. Far more than the noise of politics, it must be understood as an issue about our maritime identity, our people, and our future. The 2016 Arbitral Award on the South China Sea definitely settled the status of historic rights and maritime entitlements in the South China Sea, declaring without legal effect claims that exceed entitlements beyond the geographic and substantive limits of UNCLOS. Now part of international law, 
It provides the moorings for a regime in the South China Sea that guarantees peace and prosperity for our nations and our citizens. Canada has steadfastly supported the 2016 South China Sea Arbitral Award bilaterally and in the context of the G7. The Canadian Senate, through the motion filed in 2018 by Senator Tang Hai Ngo, acknowledged the stake that Canada shares with the Philippines and other littoral and claimant states in keeping the South China Sea peaceful. The Philippines is among Canada's closest and longest standing friends in the Indo-Pacific and its oldest partner among the ASEAN countries. The global currents demand a refocused vision and a new level of intentionality in charting the course of our partnership. The Philippines welcomes Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy as a decisive step towards Canada's more deliberate engagement in the region, including with the Philippines. I encourage Canada's full spectrum engagement beyond traditional areas such as defense. The Indo-Pacific confronts its most pronounced vulnerability in global warming, which threatens the very survival of millions of communities, especially in the small island developing states. Likewise, the security and resilience of the Indo-Pacific encompasses integrated issues from climate disaster resilience and the preservation of our ecosystems, health systems to our supply chains and connected digital infrastructure as well as mechanisms of dialogue, coordination, and cooperation for stewarding growth that benefits all. So I look forward to my meetings this week with three ministers, of, with the three ministers from Global Affairs Canada, as well as with the Immigration Minister Mark Miller and members of Parliament who form the Canada-Philippines Interparliamentary Friendship Group. I, I trust that these meetings will, of course, bring a fresh harvest of insights that would infuse our partnership with new energy. So first, just let me highlight some of the points I would like to take up in my meetings. First is greater synergy, sustainability, and impact in our programs to grow new spheres of bilateral cooperation, such as space, clean energy, and climate action, but also to strengthen existing ones, such as defense, trade, and maritime security. Secondly, a stronger sense of common purpose in the context of our shared responsibility as regional and global actors to preserve and prosper the conditions for peace, justice, and equality among nations, but also fairness, inclusivity, and accountability in the UN and multilateralism at large. We can tap the momentum from the recent elevation of ASEAN-Canada dialogue relations to a strategic partnership. Thirdly, ambition. When she visited Manila a year ago, Minister Jolie conveyed to the President the sense of Canada that now is, quote, the time for ambition. In response to this, the President stated, then, quote, let's get to work, unquote. These words I consider as my marching order from the President for this visit. My friends and colleagues, I find it useful to frame the Philippine foreign policy agenda in the context of our trajectory to become an upper middle income country very soon, and in the longer term, to realize the national aspiration for all Filipinos to enjoy strongly rooted, comfortable, and secure lives by 2040. Having outperformed all major Asian economies in 2023, the government aims for a GDP growth of about 6.5% to 7.5% this year, and international institutions place the Philippines among the fastest growing large emerging markets on track to become a $1 trillion economy, one of the eighth biggest of the Asia Pacific by 2033. Analysts also flag the Philippines as the 17th biggest consumer market in the world by 2030, and one of the fastest growing economies by mid-century. It is a goal of our foreign policy to help ensure that the Philippines delivers the promise to our people, first of all, and also as our contribution to sustain global prosperity and the well-being of people and, of course, our planet. We are as invested as Canada and other friends and partners in making the Indo-Pacific remain as an engine of global growth and a hub for human flourishing. Especially in the midst of global uncertainties and the evolving geopolitical dynamics, we are dedicated as ever 
in playing our role in keeping our region on the path of peace and prosperity. So let me conclude my remarks by recalling President Marcos's words in New York in 2022 about, quote, the Philippines having always been an, op an optimistic and courageous nation. And as I noted earlier, the Philippines spoke at the negotiations on the UN Charter for peoples and nations that were still then under the yoke of colonialism for their independence and right to self-determination. And we did the same during the framing of the UN Declaration on Human Rights more than 75 years ago. Our principled positions stand on the rock of our legacy as the first Asian Republic. So Canada can rely on this optimism and courage of the Philippines as a friend and partner as we march onward to the next 75 years of our diplomatic relations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary Manolo, for those remarks and also for your incredible patience and <laughs> true professionalism in dealing with everything that comes. As you noted in your remarks, we're living in polarizing times and everybody's entitled to their opinions. And Canada, just like Philippines, is a democracy and we welcome all views as long as they're expressed uh, peacefully and orderly. So thank you very much also for you all for your patience. Um, we really are delighted that Secretary is here with us, that he's visiting Canada, that he's been uh, able to give us a presentation on the depth of this relationship, how we can build on 75 years of friendly relations, but really take advantage of this moment. As the Secretary mentioned, this is a moment of ambition in the relationship. There's much that we can do because we are building from a position of shared values, a shared approach, a shared understanding of security dynamics, particularly in South China Sea. So I think there's much to unpack there, specifically what can we do concretely. Philippines is now building stronger alliances uh, with uh, the United States, with Australia, with Japan. Uh, I believe Philippines just last week joined another uh, quadrilateral arrangement uh, and is of course uh, a very active member in ASEAN as well. And I think in all of those uh, forums, Canada wants to find its own place and relevance and we would very much welcome uh, Secretary's suggestions on what that could look like, what specifically partnership uh, in a kind of a strategic full spectrum partnership will look like. There are centers of excellence that Canada has on the issue of space. I know Philippines wants to be a spacefaring nation by uh, 2030. Canada already has a vibrant space program. Uh, there's also stuff around cybersecurity where there's quite a bit of appetite and interest to collaborate. Both Canada and Philippines are also dealing with disinformation, with misinformation and other course of actions uh, from uh, hostile states. So there's a number of areas Areas in which we can collaborate. We're really excited that Secretary Manolo and the ministers in Ottawa will be building on that agenda. And to help us unpack that, because of course we just got a, a, a wonderful overview of the relations, but we want to be able to take advantage of Secretary's time with us to, to have a bit of a discussion. Um, so to lead us through this next section in the program, I'm delighted to be joined by a senior fellow here at the foundation, uh, but also a professor at the University of British Columbia, Dr. Kai Oswald, who's a good friend of the foundation and an expert on Southeast Asia. Uh, let's welcome Dr. Oswald to the stage for the moderated conversation. Thank you. Secretary Manolo, it's a real privilege to have you here, and we, uh, we really appreciate, as Rina mentioned, your patience here, and, and also your really far-reaching uh, overview of the Philippines and Canada relation, this really critical moment in time. And I think, if you will, that's where I'd like to start the discussion today, with the big picture. I think Canada uh, and the Philippines has an important role to play, and I think the fact that Canada has adopted the Indo-Pacific strategy I think indicates an awareness of this. And so that's what we are trying to build on with them, with Canada and, of course, other similarly situated partners. Right. But I think right. since the adoption of the Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, the doors have really been open to so many areas of cooperation. Uh, and uh, it's really in the past two years or so where our cooperation with Canada has increased at various levels. 
whether it be through consular uh, measures, through, through um, um, dealing with uh, illegal and unregulated fishing, whether it be through defense cooperation, whether it be through trade and investment, uh, and even through um, uh, migration policies, it only indicates that um, the scope for our uh, cooperation actually uh, is more comprehensive than we might think. And I don't think it should be limited only to two or three areas. That's, when I talk with the other ministers, we're going to look at, I, I think, uh, discuss other areas uh, of elevating our relationship. And I think the situation has never been better than uh, today or in the past two years. And so I, we encourage uh, Canada, for example, to continue building on its Indo-Pacific strategy. Of course, uh, dealing with the Philippines, but I think also part of the strategy is how to increase Canada's interaction to the members of ASEAN. Because uh, I think I also mentioned in my remarks that ASEAN centrality is still a key, you know, at least in my view, to preserving uh, you know, the peace and stability in the region and also to uh, promoting greater economic prosperity. Not because the ASEAN countries are powers in themselves, but ASEAN countries provide the forums and the places for countries, the powers to meet and discuss issues of, uh, of uh, concern to the region and in this way hopefully build greater trust and cooperation. And ASEAN provides the, the a, a good forum for that. And I think um, uh, it would be good if Canada would also reinforce the role of ASEAN, as well as of course uh, uh, individual members of uh, ASEAN, I mean reinforce their cooperation with them, but reinforce also the role of ASEAN uh, and ASEAN centrality. So I think um, Canada would, has a great interest in this. The very fact that they have an Indo-Pacific strategy you have means that you do recognize this probably. And so uh, action is words. And I think once, once uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy comes into, full, um, to full, into fruition or really becomes uh, a, 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 you know, a well-known fact, I think that can't but help mm -hmm. your, your, uh, Canada's ability to be part of the EAS. Uh, let me shift to, to climate and, uh, and, and uh, natural resources. This is obviously an area of significant concern globally. Uh, Canada has, uh, as, as you know, uh, the, the, the greatest coastline, the longest coastline in the world. Um, uh, management of, of fishery resources is a major concern in the South China Sea, the, 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 the East Philippine Sea for, for the Philippines. Uh, there have been some breakthroughs through the Indo-Pacific strategy, for example, the dark vessel detection system, um, and, and in a number of other ways there are clear areas of, of overlap and concerns on climate change and, and mitigating the impacts of that between the Philippines and Canada. What areas of that are you most excited about and what areas of that do you see as, um, as actionable in the near term? Well, first, uh, by way of introduction, um, uh, the, the Philippines, uh, at least under the administration of President Marcos, has now given almost number one priority to dealing with issues such as global warming and climate change. Uh, it's now really among the top of the priorities of the Philippines. So we're encouraging um, ways to, to deal with this in terms of mitigation and adaptation. I think uh, many areas which open um, themselves to cooperation, for example, is in uh, exploring renewable energies, uh, also um, helping in uh, creating greater, uh, let's say, cooperation on scientific uh, creating uh, scientific uh, cooperation and creating greater awareness, for example, to damage in the in the uh, coral reef or ecosystem, and I think um, also dealing, uh, adapting uh, uh, through to um, uh, natural disasters. You know, the Philippines right now is unfortunately among the top four countries in the world most prone to natural disasters. So that's another area uh, where cooperation is badly needed. And in fact, uh, recently at the COP28, they adopted uh, um, the Loss and Damage Fund, which is a major breakthrough, we think, in terms of dealing with uh, adaptation and mitigation of the effects of climate change. And in fact, the Philippines has uh, offered to host the, uh, the uh, headquarters of the board of the Loss and Damage Fund when it comes into, uh, into being. So, um, I, I think uh, as a, uh, I will take this up when I meet the various ministers on how we can cooperate 
uh, in areas uh, dealing with um, climate change and how the, to help the Philippines too, maybe, in trying to de-emphasize its, its reliance, for example, on coal and, and to deal more with um, uh, renew um, <coughs> renewable sources of energy too. Mm -hmm. So in other words, green energy. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, similarly in terms of, uh, you mentioned the minerals, etc. We're also trying to see how we can increase our value added in terms of the supply chains by encouraging manufacturing in our, um, especially in our mineral area, such as uh, copper. And so um, I think these are areas uh, of uh, cooperation in the future. And that's what we will, I will be discussing at least with my counterparts. Mm -hmm. To turn to people to people ties and, and I'll we're in BC here, and if we, when we head outside, we'll see the Pacific Ocean. And and you, know, you mentioned the the uh, the extensive, and it was mentioned a number of times, the extensive uh, diaspora here from the Philippines in, in British Columbia, in the long history that um, that uh, the two countries uh, have together. But for other parts of Canada, as you'll know uh, from your trips to Ottawa, uh, there is less familiarity with, uh, with the Indo-Pacific region and with Southeast Asia in particular. And I think one of the motivations for the Indo-Pacific strategy is to reorient Canada's focus to a part of the world that, as the strategy says, is the emerging center of, of economic dynamism and security challenges. Um, that's especially important, I think, for younger generations. And uh, I teach a class on politics of Southeast Asia. It's, it's always full. Uh, we have a large number of Filipino heritage students in the class. But I think that's an exception in the Canadian context. Uh, and that's a, an issue of real concern, because I think for the Indo-Pacific strategy to work, there has to be greater awareness of what the Indo-Pacific is in Canada. Um, I spoke with the ambassador uh, last week in Ottawa and we talked about um, existing MOUs, for example, and found that there are far fewer MOUs between Canadian institutions and, uh, and institutions in the Philippines than we'd like to see. Um, what, what are your thoughts on how the, the diaspora, for one, could be leveraged to increase people-to-people -people ties and familiarity, mutual familiarity, uh, with, uh, uh, across the Pacific, and, and what other ways might we be able to achieve uh, greater familiarity? Well, I, you know, when I was, uh, when I was ambassador in, a, in another post, one of our priorities was to see how we could um, um, come up with arrangements with educational institutions to promote Philippine studies. That's been also one of our priorities. Because uh, we, we think that uh, if, there's such, if such courses existed, it, uh, students and, and faculty would have much greater, or at least possibly develop a greater awareness of Philippine culture and uh, Philippine traditions, etc. And I think this this would only lead to, uh, you know, greater curiosity about the Philippines and, and maybe a, a thirst for no, more knowledge about the Philippines. And that, that in turn, uh, would certainly uh, promote uh, greater uh, interaction or people-to-people Linkages. I mean, this is aside from the the other ways, for example, of increasing tourism, etc., through more air linkages. But I think it's through education where we we uh, probably could benefit the most because this will be more sustained and would have a much uh, more substantive um, effect on developing people-to-people -people cooperation. Of course, the presence of a over a mil amount of million Filipinos here too, maybe greater involvement in in the being elected to uh, domestic, uh, in, in domestic politics, being elected to the various um, uh, political in the provinces, for example, holding various positions, that too helps. Uh, though uh, my emphasis has always been on the educational part, and I think it does help. Once, once studies are developed, uh, then students uh, would develop a greater awareness of the country, and that, that has, I think, a more lasting effect in uh, promoting people-to-people uh, -people linkages. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. We have still a quite robust audience, and I'm sure there are many questions in the audience as well. So what I'd suggest is that we turn to the audience for questions. I'll ask you to keep your questions relatively succinct, and maybe I'll suggest that we take two or three questions at a time before you answer, and that gives you scope to, uh, to provide joint answers or, or skip anything. So please do raise your hands if you have a question, and we'll pass a microphone around. Thank you. My name is Colin Lachlan. I write for a magazine in Canada called Maritime Magazine. 
Um, our editorial policy, by the way, sees great value in the Indo-Pacific strategy that Canada has, so just to let you know where I'm coming from. <laughs> we, we are very interested in the linkage between security and trade. And my recent understanding of the security on the energy issue, energy sector in the Philippines is that it is getting to a point where the Philippines is going to have to start importing energy. Uh, your Malapaya uh, gas field is almost depleted. In Canada, we're ready to bring on uh, the LNG Canada Consortium for LNG next year. Uh, you're not tied into that directly, but your neighbors are. And I'm wondering if you might be using uh, your need for LNG to, to pick it up from that. And if that's the case, does the PetroChina stakeholder role in the consortium in Canada pose you any problems? And if we get another hand, another question. Um, hi, I'm Daisy. I'm a reporter with Business in Vancouver. It's a BC-based uh, business newspaper. Uh, my question is, uh, where do you see the most uh, trade investment opportunities between BC and uh, the Philippines? And uh, what are the biggest challenges that need to be overcome? Thank you. Would you like to start with those two? Uh, okay, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start with the first. I think, uh, well, thank you very much for the, uh, the question. Yes, of course, the Philippines is facing uh, energy uh, challenges in the future, which is one of the reasons why uh, we are searching for renewable energies. But at the same time, we know it's not that easy to uh, simply shift from traditional to new. So we're also, uh, in the meantime, still have to focus a lot on our traditional energy sources, which includes coal. Uh, but even LNG is another area that we're exploring. In fact, we're having talks with countries from the Gulf states in the Middle East on this. And um, certainly we'd be open to having discussions with Canada or companies here. Uh, at the moment, we don't see, I don't see any of the China factor coming in yet because maybe we've not yet really had a discussion, serious discussions on this. But uh, certainly that would be uh, an area where we would uh, be quite open to, to discussing. And, uh, but also focusing on other renewable energies such as wind and, and, uh, and sun. So uh, I think uh, it's a total mix. And uh, the Philippines uh, under President Marcos, in fact, has, has um, undertaken some legislative changes to permit um, uh, easier investment by foreign companies in the energy sector especially in the renewables. So I think uh, that is one of the areas we're quite open to discussing. Then we'll find out if there's a problem with you know, the China angle. Um, I think on, on uh, the second question, trade investment, I think this is part of our overall uh, approach now to Canada, uh, trying to find areas, uh, build on areas, uh, aside from traditional areas of uh, trade and investment, to, to find new ones. And, I, and as I mentioned, if I was even mentioned here, even in the, in the space sector, we are very much interested in, on AI, on, digit, on digitization, and um, manufacturing. In fact, uh, in, in enhancing, for example, uh, using um, laser technology, for example, to improve our uh, semiconductor industry, because the number one export of the Philippines now is on semiconductors. So that's uh, another area we're quite we're quite interested in. So um, let me just say, I mean, without going to specifics, uh, the Philippines is, is open now to, to um, anything or any kind of cooperation which enhances mainly the four sectors where the president has already said we're attaching priority. Energy, uh, agriculture, uh, digitization, and also um, through uh, improving, uh, uh, imp manufacturing, improving our, in the, uh, increasing our value added in the supply chain, so especially in the mineral sector, or raw materials. So anything in that area, we are uh, quite open to uh, discussing. And in fact, a number of our ministers from those areas, agriculture and uh, uh, trade, have, have visited Canada also to discuss these opportunities. And vice versa, a number of Canadian missions have come to the Philippines. Thank you. 
As we're taking the next round of questions, and I see several hands on this side, and, and uh, move the microphone over, let me ask a quick follow-up. Are, are there talks underway about establishing a joint Philippines Digital Center or joint training sessions to promote, especially around AI and cybersecurity? Well, well, on cyber cybersecurity, yes, there is. Uh, we're quite interested in joining this uh, cyber. There's a cybersecurity work program, I believe, and we're certainly interested in that. In fact, I might discuss that. Uh, in my meetings here, uh, we have a work plan. We have a, a kind of plan dealing with the, on, on cyber uh, cooperation and also cyber security. So uh, that's one of the issues I plan to take up while I'm here. Yes, um, thank you, Secretary Manalo. It's uh, nice to see you again. Many years since uh, our respective time in Geneva. Uh, Paul Myers, my name. I'm affiliated with Simon Fraser University. Uh, you refer to you know, the very troubled strategic environment that we're living in now, and I wonder, um, given that um, you know, we have a dismantlement of uh, the multilateral arms control frameworks, we have uh, upsurge in nuclear saber rattling, we're resurgent uh, surge arms racing. Um, Philippines and Canada for many years have been a part of a grouping of states, the Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Initiative. Um, and I wonder if you might reflect on what steps you might see as possible for this group of concerned the non-nuclear weapon states to try to dampen this uh, current upsurge uh, in a nuclear competition between rival great powers. Thank you. And just to your right, Professor Nora Angelis from UBC. Thank you, Lokai. Uh, nice to meet you again. Uh, Secretary Manalo, uh, thank you for... Uh, being here. My question has to do with the linkages between migration, uh, education, development, and remittance. As we know, Canada is a major uh, destination for uh, Filipino uh, immigrants. We have a large diaspora, and as a result, uh, Canada has become one of the top three to five uh, re sources of remittances uh, to the Philippines. And much of this remittance uh, goes back to education, uh, you know, sending children to school. I'm uh, wondering what do you see as uh, the comparative advantage of uh, Canada uh, in supporting uh, our Philippine educational system? Uh, beyond what uh, was mentioned earlier, uh, in terms of uh, nursing and healthcare education improvement, uh, I think Canada has a very strong uh, emphasis on uh, decolonizing education and the strength of our um, secondary and the post secondary institutional system. And incidentally, we also have a lot of Filipino Canadians who are actually running a lot of uh, post-secondary education that's become a target for international students here in Canada. So I'm wondering about the Philippine strategy to that and what you see about the Canadian comparative advantage in uh, bilateral partnerships. Thank you. I'm gonna take those two questions. Uh, sure, I'll, uh, uh, on the first part, well, I, I'm glad, I'm very happy to see uh, Ambassador Meyer again. We were together in Geneva, uh, struggling through those years. <laughs> anyway, uh, well, thank you for your, uh, your question. Well, yes, I agree, the situation today is a lot different from the time maybe we were in, the, in Geneva. The, the, as the geopolitical shifts which have taken place seems to... Uh, have changed in many ways uh, the, the uh, positions of countries on various issues, and, and it's in some ways is also, in some ways, poses a, a danger to weakening the our commitment again to international rules, to international law, to treaties that we have that we agreed on even years ago, as uh, certain countries reinterpret the meaning uh, of these treaties, and that's why it's important. And the Philippines is part of a number of initiatives still in the UN to first, uh, um, to, to again re, re, uh, reinvigorate the discussions on issues which still remain relevant. For example, um, the NPT is still there. And uh, 
I don't know what the chances are now of ever making much progress given the situation. And uh, so we are certainly um, taking efforts to deal with uh, a number of disarmament issues. And, and perhaps we, uh, even this new one, the FMCT, on the Fissile Material Treaty, we are now working hard with Japan and other like-minded countries to see how we can also um, come up uh, and, and create some momentum in that area and hopefully come up with some kind of arrangements. Uh, I think it's, uh, I agree that countries such like the Philippines and Canada who have traditionally supported these issues should really speak out with other countries. Uh, it's even more important now because we see, really see a um, kind of threat to the way uh, a number of these treaties are now being uh, um, considered and, and uh, we really run a danger of, uh, of perhaps uh, entering an era of, uh, of uh, really uncertainty regarding nuclear weapons. So uh, I fully share your view, I think in a broad range of areas. Uh, this is where we should work uh, closer together. And that's what we're doing, I understand, in, now in Geneva. On the, um, well, on the right, this is a, quite a complicated question. I'll try and take it into bits on migration first. Well, on the Philippines, uh, migration uh, policy, obviously migration is very much linked to development in the Philippines, um, uh, primarily, or as is well known, through remittances. For example, last year, uh, remittances, globally, global remittances to the Philippines reached about $35 billion from our, from our diaspora around the world. So obviously um, uh, there is a strong connection between migration and development, but just let me try and put this in perspective. Our new policy now on, on uh, Philippine migration is that we are trying to create an economy, create greater more, uh, creating more opportunities for Filipinos at home and therefore making migration uh, a decision of uh, choice and not necessity. So that's where we are headed. But at the same time, uh, Filipinos have the right to travel and seek, uh, seek uh, gainful employment where they feel they should. Uh, and we are, in the, especially in the Foreign Service, and our new um, Department of Migrant Workers committed to promoting the uh, and protecting the welfare of our Filipinos abroad. So I think um, that is more or less, uh, in a nutshell, our migration policy. And uh, obviously it has great links with, uh, with education because as we learn more and more about um, other countries, Filipinos will be probably gain a better understanding or awareness of the choices available to them. And um, perhaps this is where I think um, Canada could, and the Philippines could work together in promoting more educational ties, not only, as I said earlier, in terms of uh, Philippine studies, but um, with Canada coming in uh, to the Philippines and uh, also uh, uh, perhaps helping, uh, providing training or assistance in certain areas. Thank you very much. I know there are probably other questions in the room, but we have to be mindful of the Secretary's time because he has to fly to Ottawa today, and we're extremely grateful for his time with us, for his thoughtful answers, uh, for the fact that he's previewed some of what will be happening in the next few days in Ottawa and Toronto with all of us. Uh, I also want to uh, thank Kai for very masterfully steering us through uh, that uh, uh, engaged dialogue. And for everyone in the room, I want to mention that this program is part of our ongoing initiatives with Philippines. In fact, we will be having another event in Ottawa where uh, the ambassador will be present with us next week on a collaboration with Southeast Asia, including in Philippines. We're extremely grateful, Secretary, for the fact that you've taken the time uh, for your generosity in answering all these questions, and we hope we can continue engaging with you in the future. Thank you all for, for being here with us this morning, and have a good day. Thank you.